Part 7 of Confessions of Two Brothers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Confessions of Two Brothers by John Cooper Powis and Llewellyn Powis Confessions by John Cooper Section 7 It is a natural transition to turn from such contemplation to the contemplation of personal extinction. Death. I should like to set down, if I could, what I really feel about death. I think I have as little objection to death as anyone not in actual physical suffering. Perhaps it is from a certain inherent and constant tiredness, both mental and physical, which never leaves me, that I look upon death with so little dismay. Perhaps it is also because I lean so strongly to the idea of complete annihilation. I notice that the people who fear death most are the people who believe most intensely in another life. And this is quite natural. It is their passion for life that makes them so credulous. I have no passion for life, and I regard death as an escape from a thousand annoyances. Don't let me be mistaken. I am the reverse of brave. It is not valour but cowardice which makes me look upon death so often with weary satisfaction. It is the fault of my temperament. I am so made that I feel more vividly than others the innumerable pinpricks and vexatious responsibilities that every day brings. I am always being driven into action, and action is detestable to me. I look with immense pleasure upon the hours when quietly in my grave, I shall not be called upon to do anything of any kind at all. Hatred of action is at the bottom of my character, and yet I must have change. These two antipathies together, the antipathy for doing things and the antipathy for remaining in the same place, are dominant motives of my average mood. I have absolutely no sense of possession, no love of property. I hate my books, my pictures, my furniture, my garden, and I even feel sometimes antagonistic to the charming view from my windows. I was born nomadic, anarchistic, deracinated. I can write decently when I am in hotels, inns, railway trains and foreign cities. If I am to do anything of the kind at home, it must be in a room bare of every object and with whitewashed walls. The nearer such a room approaches the austerity of a cell or a barn or a shed, the better work I do. My chief objection to living in the country is that one eternally sees the same hills and roads and fields and the same people. The last place on earth where one can be alone and unrecognized is in a country village. Every dog, every cow, every sheep, every pig, every fowl and every blackbird seems to think it necessary to greet you with a cheerful personal salutation. And as for one's neighbours, dear gentle hearts, one cannot forget them for a moment. You will say that if I have such a passion for change, it is strange that I should like seashores and deserts better than woods and fields. The point is that these pure ascetic elements, these world materials reduced to the minimum of simplicity, satisfy my desire to escape from objects and things. Woods and fields are very obtrusive objects. They are always growing leaves and dropping leaves, or growing flowers or dropping flowers. They tease one with their claims and insistencies. They have the exuberance of human acquaintances. Pet animals are the worst of all, especially dogs, those incarnations of pathos. Cats I endure very well, and even confess to a sneaking fondness for them. They remind me somehow of the irresponsible desert. They look as if they had just come from sitting crouched for a thousand years at the feet of the pyramids. I suppose my craving for change is really not so much a desire to be somewhere as to be somewhere else. I have grown weary even of Rome, and I can remember a fretting longing to turn my back on Florence. Venice, of course, is the city of my heart, but I can imagine myself wishing bitterly never to see a lagoon again. 
Before I pass from these general aspects of my feeling towards life, I should like to revert once more to the moral problem. I am above all anxious to analyse to the very bottom my objection to optimistic views of the world. Is this pride, or is it an attenuated and sublimated form of the voluptuous pleasure one sometimes derives from a sense of power over fragile and delicate things? The universe is not fragile or delicate, but many people's pleasant illusions about it are most certainly so. Is this one of the reasons why I require a universe that shall be at once ruled by necessity and ruled by chance? Perhaps I really want the prospect to be devastating to the ordinary person's temperament. Perhaps I really say in my heart, if the ordinary person and his spiritual comforters crave a friendly universe with a God behind it, then I will disturb this faith. Perhaps I really say, if the ordinary person longs for a malleable universe, a universe that we can make what we like of, then I will disturb that faith too. Do I, in fact, want a universe that shall annoy the mystic by its incurable levities, and one that at the same time shall annoy the pragmatist by its fatal austerities? No, I cannot quite believe I am as wicked as all that. What, then, are we to suppose is the true origin of this curious desire for a pessimistic interpretation of the world? Let me suggest an aesthetic origin, for it cannot be that I want delicate and sensitive souls to be outraged in their hopes. I am no devil. I want sensitive and delicate souls to be thrillingly and exquisitely happy. What I do not want is that any arrogant individual thinker should be right, or still less, that the vulgar complacent optimism of the popular poets and preachers should have any justification in the facts of the real case. Perhaps behind my wish that the universe should be whimsically perverse for the benefit of the rationalists, and rigidly rational for the benefit of the pragmatists, lies really a desire to keep the thing large and weird and outrageous and lovely, to keep the thing, in fact, the huge, grotesque, impossible, mysterious enormity which it is, a thing eluding all general solutions and thrilling us while it slays us. This question of the real nature of my dislike of optimistic interpretations, whether such interpretations be rational or instinctive, is a question that I think goes very deep. I think it goes to the very bottom of my soul. It is no doubt closely connected with another tendency of mine, which has met with reprobation at various times. I mean the tendency in criticising any well-known author of ambiguous or antinomian proclivities to throw these proclivities into vivid relief, in place of softening them or smoothing them down. The same tendency has been observed in me by unkind observers, even in the matter of ordinary conversation. Why does the fellow, such caustic observers have been led to exclaim, why does the fellow rub his hands together and gleam with satisfaction as soon as any blasphemous explosion or erotic outrage is referred to, while otherwise, as we speak of worthy people's harmless ejaculations, he sits dull and spiritless like a toad upon a log. Now what peculiarity is it in one's nature that leads to this perversity? May it not be a dramatic instinct, craving the stir and excitement, the stimulus and provocation which powerful emotions of an abnormal character alone can give? And does not the presence of such an instinct in us suggest that a world devoid of this austere and sinister complexion would be a very depressing world, a world from whose rational excellence one would long to escape. The whole question of our attitude to what is usually called evil is a profoundly difficult one, subtly intermixed with a vigorous and direct condemnation of certain things that instinctively strike us as evil, is a large and queer toleration of many things apparently regarded by the world as deserving that sinister name. 
does this only mean that we in our hearts are naturally of the company of the lost or does it perhaps imply that working through conscience the human race itself is advancing to a larger and nobler a more generous and natural view of many problems however this may be i am quite ready to admit a very close connection between my scepticism in regard to ultimate interpretations and my lack of severity in regard to many moral issues in my deepest heart i lean as i have said to the view that when we die our souls die with us though i do not as some are inclined to do close the door absolutely to other possibilities i say other possibilities not kindlier possibilities because i must confess that my more general feeling is that the dead are to be envied and that annihilation is no appalling stroke this is said in all quiet seriousness as i habitually feel it and in no mood of bitterness or bravado i do not revolt against the universe because like saturn it devours its own children it does not in the least depress me that death should end all or that i shall never meet again those i have loved all will be equal then and those who have made life exquisite for us will be with us still loved and lovers together under the gentle river of oblivion i agree from the profoundest depths of my being with the opinion of the great schopenhauer that suffering of one sort or another is a more noticeable and persistent thing in life than any happiness or joy our pleasures come and go like swallows touching the surface of a stream but the waters of unhappiness flow on without pause swift dark and deadly it is perhaps this underlying sense of the inherent discomfort of life and its strange beauty that leads me to feel a certain weary indignation with those who would interfere with the few golden hours which fate allows to us all i think it is perhaps just there that i would draw the line of my own ethical code people who by their unkindness by their gloomy selfishness by their spiteful vindictiveness or peevish jealousy darken and discolour the days of those whose fate it is to live with them seem to me bad people i condemn them and struggle against them and am favourably disposed to all who are their enemies i never feel the least scruple of conscience in helping the victims of these people to escape from their clutches they are the accomplices of everything that makes life intolerable they are themselves the leaden heart of its burden rough coarse-grained overbearing tyrants despots with more will-power than intelligence and more intelligence than sensitiveness these are the beings my soul loathes and my moral sense condemns passionate criminals murderous criminals i regard of course with natural apprehension but i feel no spark of moral anger against them in cases of lynching my sympathies are always with the person who is being lynched as for thieves forgers bandits and other enemies of society though i have a selfish disinclination to fall into their hands my moral sense remains quite unstirred by their depredations i am even sometimes tempted to fancy that they take back no more than what is their own all property as the frenchman said is robbery and though being no saint i cling fiercely enough to my spoils i am no hypocrite in my sense of possession i do not regard myself as superior to the wastrel because i have had the luck to inherit hoarded plunder between me and the tramp there is nothing but the difference of pure chance end of part seven